Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Barry Hewson, Executive Director of the National Ballet of Canada. As Canada's premier dance company, the National Ballet presents a full range of traditional full-length classics. Barry has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Barry, for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Let's talk about ballet. Sure. It is an art that, ha that extends back for hundreds of years, yet keeping it fresh in today's media-intensive, uh, completely electronic uh, scene has got to be a challenge. Talk about the relevance of classical performance and ballet in particular to today's audiences. Sure, I mean I think of, of ballet today as, as a living theater. It's very important that um, while we protect the classics uh, and National Ballet has a, a great um, legacy of protecting the great classic ballets, they're also pushing the boundaries on contemporary dance and having helping the audience to to look ahead and look forward uh, as the art form evolves and uh, become and continues to be relevant to today's people. Um, as we look to the future, we need to continually ask ourselves how can we um, evolve the theater experience for, for a live audience. We as leaders in the arts need to continually look at reinventing um, the theater going experience that we, we tend to be uh, we tend to be very innovative on stage but less innovative behind the footlights and sort of how we approach um, delivering our brand and delivering the experience to our audience and for, for instance you, you, you go to a theater and you sit in the dark with a program that's uh, handed to you moments before the performance and you're frantically trying to read through program notes and casting and so forth and um, I'm, I'm constantly challenging my team to think about what we can do differently to sort of reinvent that experience, to leverage technology, um, to allow our audience to, to know more about what they're going to experience before they right. sit in the theater, um, to have an opportunity to interact through, through blogging and other kinds of, of, of um, tactics um, so that they have an interactive experience. Um, and that they continue to talk about the experience after it's over. Well, there's also a vocabulary of dance, in particular classical performance, that audiences today are just not familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, the performers are familiar with it, the artistic directors are familiar with it, uh, but sometimes that familiarity becomes a problem. And so you end up with a disconnection uh, with your audience unless you're, you find a way to bring that audience along, and I think you are you, you are making a profound point that by assuming that the audience experience that has really remained reasonably static for the last 150 years mm -hmm. in terms of being in seats with dark, you know, in a dark theater with programs, that whether that that context is actually the same as the context that it, uh, that it was 150 years ago. Right. Because 150 years ago, those, that, that audience came into the theater with more information. So how do, how do you actually deal with that issue? I think it's really important to know what you do well and to know what works and to codify that and to repeat that, and that's important. But I think it's equally important to create an environment where innovation um, is encouraged and that failure is an option. Um, and that's really challenging in, in the nonprofit field because, quite frankly, resources are so restricted that um, that from a, on the business side of the art, um, there is a very low tolerance for risk and a very low tolerance for failure. Um, and so I'm I'm intrigued at the idea of creating a, a culture of innovation on both sides of the footlights. And how we can do that is by creating a, a, a dedicated funding source that allows um, uh, innovative ideas to be tested. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I think about it much as the tech industry thinks about innovation is sort of how do we uh, identify potentially game-changing innovations that can fail fast, that we can test, that can fail fast, we can learn from that and move forward. Um, I think we don't do enough of that in the arts and I think that it's the only way forward. I th the definition of insanity is repeating the same behavior over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think um, we've been playing it safe for a, a bit too long and, and so that's you know, as a leader, that's something that's very important to me and something that I'm trying to drive, drive home to the teams that I've worked with in other companies and certainly at National Ballet. And this is the art that occurs on the other side of the footlights, the, the arts yeah. administration yeah. side. How do you bring audiences along? How do you engage audiences? How do you end up taking that engagement and monetizing it so mm -hmm. that the, the artist, what, what happens on the stage is self-sustainable? Right, I mean, I think it's the same 
it, it's, it's the same as the evolution of the, the art itself. I mean, if you think about the great failures in, in dance over the, over the decades, um, you know, Rite of Spring was oh. one of the biggest um, failures, nearly caused riots, and today is cherished as one of the true classics and one of the really groundbreaking works of art um, of its time. So I think, um, I don't think anyone would, would say today that the Rite of Spring, um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring was a failure. It was a, it was a great success and it's an important part of our history. And so I, that's how I think about it on both sides of the footlights is that we, we will make mistakes. They're gonna be very strategic. Um, we're going to make sure the organization is protected while we, while we try new things. Uh, but we're gonna take chances and we're gonna stretch and we're gonna, we're gonna try to make sure that um, we understand how people are thinking about the art, how, they're, how people are um, uh, assimilating to information, how, they're, how they want to receive information, how they want to participate. You know, we've done a lot of work, and particularly at Boston Ballet, we worked a lot on, on building our, uh, the age diversity of our audience and um, trying to bring more, more young people to the theater. And I think what we learned through that experience of, of um, small focus groups and some of the conversations that came out of that process was that they really don't want a static experience. They don't want to come and sit um, on one side of the proscenium and just experience passively the art. They want to engage. They want to know the artists. They want to know something about the composers and the choreographers. They want a, an inside view. And then I think even more importantly, they want to engage with the artists as members of their community. There's sometimes a discussion in, in art circles about um, art um, on the terms of the artist versus art on the terms of the audience, as if these are two mutually exclusive right. concepts, right. where art on the terms of the audience is really pandering, right. and art on the terms of the artist is pure. But isn't it also possible to do both? There's no question. Um, I do worry, uh, particularly in America, the regional dance movement that that Balanchine had a large hand in, the Ford Foundation had a large hand in creating a number of, uh, of regional companies around the United States. Um, Balanchine really wanted uh, ballet to be available uh, across the country in, in small and mid-sized communities as it was available in some of the larger cities. And Ford Foundation um, seed funded a lot of companies like Pennsylvania Ballet and Atlanta right. Ballet and the like. Um, and those companies that are sort of in the mid-budget range have uh, have been probably most, most significantly impacted by um, the the this um, the infra the infrastructure that the, or the uh, sustainability issues around financially supporting the vision in these communities, and I think um, what's happened in the regional ballet community is that there's been a there has been a bit of a dumbing down. There has been a bit of too much of worrying about instead of challenging the audience to see dance in new ways there's been a bit of pandering. It's been a bit about um, the Draculas and sort of the, you know, <laughs> these, the, um, the not terribly great art, um, right. um, but a title that, that has some kind of mainstream relevance. And I, I really admire artistic directors who, who don't give in to that, but at the same time, I think we have to listen. We have to listen to the audience. We have to make sure, I, I believe, um, and I've, I've seen it particularly in, in Boston, uh, Miko Nissanen has really cha challenged the Boston arts community. He came to the company 12 years ago, and um, this was this is a very conservative. It was a very conservative town, and um, he came and said, "We're going to we're going to shake things up. We're going to we're going to introduce a contemporary, a really um, high level, exciting uh, contemporary dance program that's that um, is going to you know is going to definitely ruffle some feathers." And took he took a lot of ch ch chances early on. Um, in challenging that audience, and today they're open to um, a range of experiences in the theater that 10 years ago they wouldn't have even considered, um, uh, that wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Boston Ballet had actually not only traversed a considerable artistic journey, but also a considerable operational journey. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about uh, Miko's art. Talk about the, the administrative journey, the mm -hmm. The, um, the institutional journey that, mm -hmm. that you've also helped to undertake. Well, it's interesting. Um, I, I've had the opportunity uh, in my career to work at, with organizations at a variety of budget levels and staffing levels and board sophistication and all of those things, and um, it's been an interesting journey. I decided uh, after I 
arrived at Atlanta Ballet that I must be a turnaround guy. That must be the thing I'm going to be because I keep inheriting these organizations that are in crisis. And um, what I've learned in my career is that the whole field is in crisis, that, that the, the, our ability to um, sustain art making at the highest levels of integrity and the costs associated with doing that um, are outpacing our ability to, to find ways to financially support it. And uh, that, that is, um, I don't see that as a problem as much as I see it as a unique challenge and one that, that, um, that I'm quite excited about. I've, I've spent uh, a good chunk of my career um, working on this concept of a sustainable model for dance. And um, I don't have the answers. Uh, I'm, I, well, whoever figures it out <laughs> is going to do quite well. And part um, of it's intensely practical. You raised $14.5 million, yeah. I think, at, in Atlanta. Exactly. Uh, so that's, that's a very practical, yeah. you, you needed to raise the money. There, there are opera operating issues. There are issues with uh, the audience, diversifying the audience, helping to bring in younger audiences, your future audiences, uh, helping to bring in audiences of different backgrounds and different sensibilities. Right. Well, I think I think there's there's a couple of layers. I mean, we could have we could talk for hours about um, sort of being in the weeds on all of the kinds of things that we did to try to to, to begin to um, change the direction. Uh, of the organization and to try to address challenges. I, I think of it at a, at a 50,000 foot view. I think what we've had to do in every organization that I've had um, the benefit of being part of is that we had to, most of those organizations were facing significant uh, financial challenges and we had to create a perception of, perception of momentum before we could actually achieve momentum. We did a couple of things, both in Atlanta and Boston. First of all, we, we told the story. Um, in a very transparent way to the donor community. Um, I think um, with any community and with any nonprofit organization that um, that has had challenges, I think there's a there's a level of donor fatigue that sets in. People are sort of tired of you know the ballet's in trouble again, and I think um, the only way to change it is to change it and, and is to tell a different story. And so what we what we did in Atlanta and Boston is we went out to the philanthropic community and said yes yes we have challenges and here's where they came from. Here's what, what what we believe happened to cause us to be in the situation we're in. Here's what we're doing about it today, and here's what we're going to do over the next three or four years to turn it around. Um, in both Atlanta and Boston, the donor community really reacted positively to just being told the truth, just being told in a very transparent way, look at there are problems and here's what we're going to do. Um, so that was really step one, is really that case for giving, telling the story about what happened and what we're going to do about it um, going forward. And then the second was really putting together um, that, that um, infusion of capital that would allow for the organization to get out of this sort of um, culture of looking over your shoulder and worrying about what happened behind you right. and being able to truly look forward. Um, and that's, in, in both of those cities, that was what was critical to, to changing the game. And the development of an artistic program that gave the perception of, of vitality, yeah. um, as opposed to constantly relying on tried and true yeah. downward spiral types, types of uh, programming mm -hmm. where people attend once a year and, and then they forget about yeah. the ballet for the rest of the year. Well, what's interesting is, it, particularly in Boston, the art was not the problem. The company had, um, I think, perception of the past was more of a problem regarding the art, so people, uh, people have long memories, and there was a time in history when the Boston Ballet wasn't the strongest uh, company. And and people who've been around Boston for a long time, you know, you talk to someone and say, "Oh, I've been to Boston Ballet, it wasn't very good." And oh. you say to them, "Well, when did when did when did you come last?" And they say, ago. "17 years ago." And you say, "Well, <laughs> you should try out. You should come check us out again." That created its own set of unique challenges because you have this perception of this brilliant artistic director and this product that people feel really good about, and yet. You know we're struggling to pay the bills. So, uh, but the good news is I think that you know we we have changed that story. Uh, Boston Ballet is arguably in the best condition it's ever been in, both financially and artistically. Um, uh, I think one of my proudest moments was sitting in the theater at the Coliseum in London and watching the curtain go up on on this American company. That again, talking about long memories, we had been to London 30 years prior as Rudolf Nureyev's backup dancers, and it was not necessarily the proudest moment for the company. 
and, um, and, and Londoners, again, have long memories. And so I think there was, people came to the theater with um, a certain level of expectation, and to watch that audience be completely blown away um, in such a positive way, um, uh, and for, for those who know London audiences in general, they're not wildly demonstrative, and um, you know, they leapt to their feet at the end of the program. I mean, for me, that was a sign of two things. One, that the company was in London, we self-presented, we were financially healthy enough to bring a, a, a company of, of 90 dancers and technicians and staff um, across the ocean. Um, uh, we had e exceptional attendance and engagement by London audiences, and then the artistic product was just at the highest possible level and, and engaged the audience in, in a way that, um, that not even we, who were quite confident in what we were presenting, not even we expected to have that kind of reception. So um, it was a proud moment because it was, it was sort of the art and the business finally coming into alignment. And, um, and that is, as a, as a leader and a, as an administrator, there's nothing better than to know that that, that transformation has happened. And so um, when it was time to step away um, from Boston to pursue this opportunity in Toronto, I did it with great confidence. The, great, the greatest compliment I've ever received was in the Boston Magazine in covering my departure, said that my exit was, was, um, was the least disruptive exit in the history of the company. <laughs> um, and I had to read it three or four times to make sure I was okay with <laughs> how they were choosing to, to position it. But the point was, look at the, the company is in such great shape. It's a, it's a, I'm very proud of that and, and, and I'm proud of my partnership with Miko in making all of that happen. What attracted you to the National Ballet of Canada? Well, uh, so many things, uh, quite honestly. I, I think big decisions like this in life and in your career are um, family decisions. I have two young children. I have a, a wife who's a professional actor. And, um, and I, so we, there were a lot of things that we weighed, but I have to say that the company itself, in terms of the career decision, um, Karen Kane is um, an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary artist, and um, quite a visionary director. Um, I, I felt an immediate um, connection with her, which I think is so critically important. The, the ballet world operates in this, what I call the two-headed two monster right. model of uh, management where, where there are two CEOs essentially not re not responsible to each other but reporting independently to a board and so it's very much like a marriage you see there's chemistry there or there's not chemistry there and Miko and I in Boston had terrific chemistry and we did great things together and it worked but um, but sometimes that doesn't work and I when I met Karen I just felt like I had known her forever I felt like we were um, we had we were connected somehow and um, I admire her vision. I think I think um, I think it's something that I can add value to. And and uh, quite frankly, I'm excited about being in a country where there's some public support for the arts. I think that that's um, a huge challenge in America. And the ba Boston Ballet receives le less than half of one percent of its budget um, through government sources, through local, regional, and um, state and federal sources. And that just puts all that much more pressure on the donor community to have to rise to the occasion. It's also about validating um, the importance of this art form to to um, the pu to the public when when there's um, when there's government support for the arts in a meaningful way that's that's um, that's sort of fully integrated in the culture of a country. Um, it just changes the game. You know, you go to Paris or London. I was just in Paris and London last spring, and I went to the Paris Opera and I went to the Royal Opera House to see some performances. And I went to the box office to change tickets, and I was I was so blown away by the people standing in line at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, every walk of life, you had right. people dressed to the nines. You had tourists in shorts and t-shirts. You had people, uh, uh, workers in in uniforms, uh, waiting. At, in the line to change their tickets or to buy, purchase tickets to the ballet. And that's, in America, you just don't see that kind of diversity. It, you don't see the whole community coming together as part of its culture to participate in this art form. And it's younger. The art form's younger in, in this country, and uh, that's understandable. But I do think it's a signal um, to the public when, when um, government sources 
uh, recognize the importance and the value of artists and arts institutions um, to the, the cultural fabric of the community. I don't think it's really the government sources that are so important. I think that, that it's more the diversity of support. The mm -hmm. fact that civic society is, is voting, mm -hmm. that these uh, discussions take place in so many different fora, that it's not just a matter of uh, an institution that is sitting there and competing in its own place against other people, but instead you have the civic society coming together and saying, you know, this is important. This is important for the civic life of our city. Mm -hmm. It's important for our youth. It's important to give a diversity of experience beyond the 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 uh, the iPad or the mm -hmm. or or the computer. It's about uh, nice to have versus versus must have. And is art. A must have. Is, is art a nice to have or is it a must have? I believe it's a must have. I believe it's a if I believe it's a reflection of our society and our culture. Um, I think it's a it's an empowerment tool to to make communities better and stronger. It's an empowerment tool for individuals to get better and stronger. It's it's uh, the arts are powerful um, in lots of different ways. They're powerful economic generators. I think time and time yes. again we've proven that. And contrary wise, if art was not important, then why would design be important mm -hmm. to an organization like Apple? Mm -hmm. Why would design mm -hmm. be important to automotive companies or to consumer product companies? Why mm -hmm. do we care about what package mm -hmm. our soap comes in? Mm -hmm. It's all about design. Mm -hmm. It's all about art. Right. I think it's fascinating that you know we are in this era of the creative economy and um, and yet there are people that still don't quite make the connection between creation creation and economy and economy and and in fact we live in a different society um, and and the creative economy economy is driving us forward and the arts arts institutions in our communities really can play a central role um, in in building that that creative economy well Barry Houston thank you so much for sharing your experience through all the years uh, of your contributions to dance uh, with us and thank you so much for your insights it's my pleasure thanks Thank you.